at the risk of, uh, of using the wrong language that, um, that on governance, and, uh, and I think I probably, I, as an ex-politician, I'm really treading on dangerous ground here, but I'm going to speak about good governance. Um, not that it's the be-all and end-all of uh, human endeavor, but I think it is safe to say that all things good are more difficult to achieve when you have bad governance. And arguably, there's a direct correlation between good governance and better standards of living, higher standards of uh, justice. Uh, certainly, there's an impressive body of academic research that would back that up. Uh, international organizations, United Nations, OECD, and others regularly put out good governance index to, to show where, that, where people are the standing in the world of how good their governance is. Uh, domestic watchdogs here in Canada uh, make similar claims. They you know, claim the more democratic, the more accessible, the more accountable your governments, the better the outcomes are for everyone. You know, it's better economically uh, because investors are attracted to stability and certainty. Uh, human rights index is highest where governance is best, where the rule of law is codified and understood and practiced and enforced. And, and even in very local governments like school boards, uh, uh, housing authorities, child welfare agencies, and so on, uh, where everyone understands the system, uh, where, they, where they know the role and expectations of the citizen, where they, where they know what the elected officials are supposed to do, when they know what the staff are supposed to do, and it's all clear to everyone, well then the outcomes are just better and the results are, speak for themselves. Uh, for many First Nations, uh, particularly those who are saddled with governance models dictated by the archaic uh, 19th century Indian Act, uh, good governance is only a dream. The Indian Act is based on an assumption that First Nations are wards of the state, served uh, by local governments with very limited powers, really very limited, and they're always subject to the final authority of the Minister of Indian Affairs. So they live in a paternalistic system uh, where some far-off minister or uh, bureaucrat calls the shots in decisions that really should be made locally. Uh, change is possible, but it's very difficult uh, because citizens, especially because citizens have often been under-empowered, if you will, for decades and they don't, they've never lived, not grown up with anything else, and so they frequently default to the status quo. They just say, well, there's a lot of challenges to changing this, and so rather than buck the system uh, and, and get some of the benefits of a modern governance system, they just kind of go slow or, or don't see it or, or just haven't lived with the alternative. I do think things are changing. Uh, many First Nations are choosing to opt out of the Indian Act. They're choosing uh, and its election rules. They're cho choosing their own custom election codes with much success. Uh, some First Nations want the Indian Act provisions themselves to change. Uh, others are moving to self, uh, complete self-government, of course, that's good. Uh, uh, many are moving, no matter what system they're under, many are moving to evaluate and assess their own systems. For example, the BC Assembly of First Nations recently announced that they've designed tools to actually assess the, how good their own governments are doing so that they can help one another and uh, do the evaluation and, and to uh, reinforce best practices uh, to improve their own standards of governance. But I think the benefits of good governance are obvious. Better decisions are made, uh, uh, better citizen, more citizen engagement, uh, better outcomes, there's transparency, accountability. And there's a pride, frankly, that comes from doing things right. There's three quick steps that I'd suggest that, that can help make this happen. First, the federal government should continue to work with First Nations to change the provisions of the Indian Act so that the best governing practices of the 21st century and, and uh, ironically, of centuries well past uh, can be adopted locally. These, uh, many of these changes seem mundane to Canadians that have not had to live under, I don't have to live under the Indian Act, but I've certainly seen it. Uh, and I think many Canadians would say, well, you know, that's kind of mundane, but I think the results will be profound in First Nation circles if we can make these changes. I, things like changing the, these are proposals that came from uh, here in Manitoba, for example, to change the election cycle from four, two years to four years so that you're not constantly electioneering with all the problems that go with that. It changed the rules so that election irregularities are appealed to First Nation authorities instead of appealed to the Minister of Indian Affairs. Uh, develop uh, penalties or, or rules that that First Nations themselves can administer if somebody goes outside the rules, breaks the breaks the, the rules, so to speak. Right now, the federal minister is obligated to intervene, and I tell you, there's almost nothing harder than that because you know you're intervening in something you've got no business mucking around in. And I've had to do it, and I don't like, and I never liked it. It's very difficult. All jurisdictions in Canada uh, have those kind of powers and, and rules, and they use them uh, properly. 
and then give authority for making bylaws over the local First Nations. What Ovid was mentioning earlier, it's ridiculous, you know. Uh, the, the limited amount of bylaw um, that, that First Nations are allowed to make in application to their own lands and own people is, uh, is embarrassing, and they're always subject to being overruled by the federal minister, even at that. So we have to change the way bylaws uh, that, that really regulate everything from how to develop land to how you govern yourselves, all that should be changed and the minister shouldn't have a role in that. And then we need to find a way to move First Nation membership and community citizenships to local governments rather than keeping it in Ottawa. So the federal government can uh, and should help willing First Nations with capacity buildings. They should reward those that to take advantage of it with things like block, multi-year block funding, greater governing tools such as access to world markets through the First Nations statistical Management Act, just like other governments have access to financing and all those sort of things. So the federal government has lots to do. Uh, First Nation chiefs, uh, councils, and government have a to-do list as well, I think. Uh, they need to develop the tools, as I mentioned earlier, to, access, to assess their own governments, uh, publicly answer for the good and the bad. It can be intimidating, but the, re the rewards are clear. And uh, dealing with other governments and with corporations and others is just so much easier when you have a well-oiled First Nation machine, govern governing machine. You know, the bylaws is a good example. When, you're, when your government can make the rules, can respond quickly to a, a need from a, a corporation says, I'd love to invest, uh, what's the bylaws say? And you say, well, in six or eight years, we'll get a change in the bylaws for you. It takes that long. They just walk away and, and uh, don't, don't even deal with you. So it can be a great thing. I think the rewards are, are going to be great. Uh, I urge First Nations as well to consider, uh, and this is, you know, no business of mine or anybody else's, but I think I would urge them to consider a, um, a common election time or, or a date or a period, a, a closely aligned time, to strengthen the ability to influence decisions that affect First Nations. Uh, I just can't overemphasize the frustration that many other levels of government feel. I think in an honest attempt to, to work with and understand and build relationships with First Nations only to find out that the slate of leaders you sat down with last month, a third of them changed this month, a third of them will change six months from now, and, and just when you strike the committees and get a work plan and so on, you're back to square one, learning the new people, trying to find out what everybody wants to do, and it, the cycle just goes, I tell you, it is an awful cycle where I think people of good intent just sort of give up because they, they never have a set group of people uh, for four years to say, that's why the municipalities have done it, right? They come in and they say, we've got this group of people for four years to get a set, an end result, and we're going to hold you to account. I, I really encourage that. I think it could be uh, very effective for First Nations to, uh, to maximize their, their influence. And finally, for First Nations citizens, uh, I think they, for those that, that say, well, I'm a little worried about passing this, the, all this power over to the chief and council, you know, what about it? I say, look, there's I mean, there's no guarantees in this world, but frankly, the opportunities, the excitement, there's some challenges, of course, but the opportunities for a modern accountable system that uh, answers to you, the citizenry, is, is just clear and obvious. You look at self-governing First Nations across the country, and clearly it is, um, it's just a way better system and that they should embrace. Uh, if, if for those that have lived for generations under the Colonial Indian Act, uh, it means a quantum shift in thinking obligation, accountability, accountability, transparency, I realize that, but we are well past the time when First Nation governments should derive their power from the Indian Act and from the minister. In whatever manner they choose, and I'm not one to suggest what manner it is, but whatever manner, chiefs and councils should derive their power from their own citizens, not from the Indian Act and not from the minister. And then they should enjoy the benefits and pride that comes from good governance because that is their right.